Hi guys, welcome back to another video in the DIY CNC build series. So what I'm going to show you today is a brief overview of how I plan to lay out the electronics in the enclosure. The main purpose of today's video though is to give you a desktop demonstration of how to wire up the NEMA 23 closed loop motors, get them all connected up to the stepper drivers. I'm also going to show you how to set up and install Mac 3 on a Windows PC. We can then interface Mac 3 to our little control board and test out our NEMAs by sending signals to the control board which go through to the stepper driver and ultimately move the motor. So let's dive straight into it. Right guys, so we're back at the CNC here and as you can see I've got some components laid out on the bench top here. So before we get into this video, I'm gonna give you a bit of a disclaimer because this is a dangerous part of the process. You know, we're dealing with power electronics and mains here, which if done incorrectly, can cause damage to existing appliances. It can blow fuses, and if you touch something that's alive, it could potentially kill you. So don't underestimate power and electronics. It can give you a nasty surprise, and sometimes you only get one chance. So be very careful. The dangerous area is this area down here. I am not a qualified electrician. I have no certification to be an electrician. I do have a degree, a master's degree in embedded systems and electronics. So I have a very good working knowledge of electrical principles and power. I'm very familiar with working with lower power devices like these and embedded system boards, microelectronics. I'm very confident wiring this also. While I don't have qualifications to do this, I understand it through my own experimentation and learning. So throughout the process of the next few videos, I'll show you everything I do here. Just be aware that when it comes to the power electronics, you need to take extra care, ensuring that it is safe for wherever you live and whatever regulations you have to abide by. I'm in the UK here, like I said, I have 230, 240 volts coming from the wall AC. The colors of the wiring in my video may not match yours. So just be very aware that wherever you live, your situation might be different to mine and what you see in this video. So it's very important that when you do this, you get it looked at and signed off by a qualified electrician before you turn anything on. Extremely important. So with that explained, what I'm gonna do now is proceed to show you how I'm gonna set this up for me, my machine, and where I live. Hopefully you understand that you must take responsibility for your wiring. So this has been laid out here in a very sort of organized fashion because one of the things I've done for this system is I've ordered an electrical box like this one. Now this is a very high quality one. It's built to be outside in any, any weather conditions. It's made of steel. And like I said, very high quality, which is what you want. This costs 90 pounds. Now you don't have to go down this route. Lots of people out there build their own out of wood or acrylic. But again, there are safety issues around that too. I want mine to be as safe and as clean a layout as possible. So I don't mind spending a little bit extra to ensure that I've got the best safety. This box here is 600 by 400 by 200. So if I grab a tape here, you can see that's 600. So we've got quite a lot of room in there to play with. We've got 400 this way. So it just about fits in there. And we've got 200 depth. So it's quite a big unit. But like I said, lots of space to do some neat cable management. And remember, I also want to put a little mini computer in here as well so that the machine can all run out of this one unit. So what I'll do now is I'll talk you through my plan here in terms of this implementation and how I plan to manage everything and keep it all as clean as possible. I have these at the top here. These are glands. These generally just make sure that when cables are entering an enclosure that they're safe and not able to be pulled. Because if you think about it, if you've got a metal box, a lot of people will just drill a hole in it and feed a cable through it like this. The problem is over time, if your wire is rubbing and rubbing on metal, what this can lead to is ultimately fraying of the cable and ultimately exposing live copper 
to a metal surface. To avoid that, you tend to use these things, which clamp down nice and tightly onto the cable. And that allows you to, as I said, tighten it down. These sort of squeeze in as you tighten it. And you can also, on the hole that you've drilled on the outside of the enclosure, you pop this in, you bolt it from the inside, so it locks, and then you tighten your cable down. These are highly recommended and generally standard in electronics today. So let's take a look at how this is going to work then. So at the very top here, I'm going to have my mains wall voltage coming in, 230, 240 volt AC. That's going to be fed straight through this emergency stop switch. That needs to be at the start of the chain because ultimately, in the event of a problem, by hitting this, we want to cut power to everything. So that is going to be your first port of call, an emergency stop. From there, the power will come out and go to this two gang switch here. Now, this one isn't essential, it's more of a feature. So the reason I've got this, as you can see, it's quite a nice switch. This is actually rated for outdoors. But I love the design of it, and it actually has some LEDs on the sides too, which let you know what's on and off. I like that, and it looks a lot nicer than the ones you sort of get for indoors, the plastic white PVC ones. So this switch is going to control two separate circuits. I've decided to put the VFD on circuit one, and the rest of the electronics on circuit two. The reason for that is for safety to have them on separate circuits but the reason for the switch is just convenience if for example this is constructed and I have this on top of my electronic box I can switch the spindle and the rest of the components on separately so there might be a scenario during calibration or testing where I want to be able to run the machine using Mach 3 and I want to move the steppers but I don't want this on so in that scenario I can keep the spindle off and switch everything else on. Or well, generally you want to boot this up first, you start there and then you switch your spindle on and go from there. That can also act as another switch to terminate the spindle in the event of an issue, although your main call is the emergency stop. So like I said, this is two different pathways here from our mains. This one is going to be the switch for the spindle and this one's going to be the switch for everything else. Now down here, this will route around here, and at the bottom I have two fuses. Now it's very important to fuse these two separate circuits. It's not essential, like I said, it'll work if you don't fuse them, but you'd be unwise not to, simply because we're dealing with some serious power here. This is rated at 2.2 kilowatts. You work that out, you know, coming in the wall there at 230, 240, we're dealing with, at its absolute max, just shy of 10 amps there. A kettle is 2 kilowatt. You know, you wouldn't run a kettle without a fuse because if something goes wrong, it can damage your consumer unit in the house, for example. So the whole point of fusing is to protect everything else, right? So, like I said, 10 amps. This means I've got a 10 amp fuse here. So it'll run from switch 1 down through this fuse and out. The other switch here will have a cable routing down and around and into this fuse, which will be three amps. This is a six amp fuse, but I have a three amp fuse on order. I just had this lying around for demonstration purposes. The three amp fuse will power everything in regard to the electronics up here, driving the, the NEMAs, the control board. I have a small computer in here as well like i said that'll all come off the three amps everything related to the spindle will come off the 10 amp fuse and let's let's do a scenario right so we're running the spindle and something goes majorly wrong there's a huge short circuit in here which creates a massive spike in current now if we didn't have a 10 amp fuse to protect everything that massive current spike would propagate through everything else, including this, and fry your components. Now, with a fuse in place, rated at 10 amps, we know that this should never exceed 10 amps. 
In fact, it's about 9.2, I think, 9.5. And we know that when the spindle's running, it's not drawing anywhere near that anyway. That's just peak current, generally on startup. Or if it gets stuck or jammed, you will see that current rise. So in the event of a current spike, this would trigger the fuse to break. And that will stop that current from coming back here and affecting the rest of the circuitry. Same goes for this fuse. If these power supplies happen to fail, again causing a large spike in current, having them fused separately from this will stop that spike in current propagating out and into this circuitry. So it's just a way of separating the two to mitigate any potential damage or failures in the future particularly around this because we're dealing with such high amounts of power with that. So from the fuses we would just simply wire them to the VFD from the 10 amps and we'd wire it to these two power supplies from the 3 amps. You might say well how do you know the value of the fuses? Well I just explained that one to you. If you take your equation power equals voltage times current. If you divide your power by voltage you'll get the amps. So in this case 2200 watts divided by 240 that's going to be around 9 amps therefore we know that a 10 amp fuse is suitable because this should never go above 10 amps and if it does we want this to trigger similarly with the 3 amp fuse I've worked out that my NEMAs require around 7-800 watts of power this is a 24 volt 5 amp supply. These two combined, the amps should never exceed 3. So if there's an issue here, it would cause a spike triggering the fuse, i.e. protecting this. So you see how it works both ways. So this power supply here will then feed this board to drive the signals for the proximity sensors. This power supply will simply provide power to the stepper motor drivers. Now one of the questions that I see a lot and I seem to see people struggling with is how do I work out what power supply I need for my motor drivers? And I'm going to show you how to do that, it's quite simple. So I put this sheet together here, hopefully you can see that well. Now this top section here is the specification of my NEMA 23 closed loop motors. This is from the manufacturer's website and a data sheet. You'll find these on Stepper Online, which is where I got mine. And the relevant part here is the one highlighted, which is rated current, which is 4.2 amps. Now that is the RMS rated current, which is generally what we use when we're talking about power. If you're familiar with audio systems, you'll have a peak power and an RMS power. Generally, we run with the RMS value because that's a continuous signal. Now, this equation here, again, is taken straight from Stepper Online. I haven't pulled this out of thin air. They've provided this on their website, and this is what the values represent. So we've got power is equal to the number of motors that you have. In my case, it's four times the motor rated current, which we have up here is 4.2 amps, times the voltage of your power supply. Now, if you look at one of your Stepper drivers, You'll see at the bottom VDC, these generally have a range. This one is between 18 volts and 50 volts. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to running them at lower or higher voltages. I'm not gonna get into that here. But generally, a good rule of thumb when you're first starting up and setting this out is to go in the middle, right? So my power supply here is 36 volts. And we have a nice value on the end there, 1.2, which I call kindness. Right, so let's first of all work out what is the exact power requirements of these four stepper drivers. So what we have here is power is equal to 4 times 4.2, which is because we have four drivers times our rated current of 4.2 amps. And then we're times in that by 36, which is the voltage of our power supply. So the exact power requirements for my four NEMA motors is 604.8 watts. 
Now most people you might work that out and go right sorted what I'm going to do now is buy a 600 watt power supply and I should be good. Well in theory it would probably do it you know it'll run that the problem is that your power supply is going to be working overtime and it's essentially going to be under maximum load all the time to run these drivers. Now bear in mind that this will not be pulling that constantly. Like I said before, the chances of these being under full load all at the same time is very unlikely. So we probably wouldn't come near this value. However, to be safe and to be kind to our power supply and give it some breathing room, you add 20%, right? So we take 604.8 times 1.2, which gives us 725.76 watts. So that value there just gives your power supply some breathing room so that it's not under full load all the time. With this value, you could probably go for a 750 watt supply and be absolutely fine. But when I was buying these, an 800 watt was something like a pound more. So I went for an 800 watt supply, giving my system even more breathing room. Hopefully that gives you a better idea of how you can work out your power requirements for your NEMA stepper motors. Like I said, it seems to cause a lot of confusion, but hopefully I've explained this in a nice way where you can see where all these values go and help you choose the right power supply. Another thing I wanted to discuss with you here is wiring, right? So a few of these things I still need to add to the cost of the CNC, including like fuses, these switches, I'll add it all on there. So what I've got is a four core cable which is going to be for the spindle I think there's five meters of that there which should be plenty to get us from here up and to the top of the spindle the routing of my power in from the mains I'm just going to use the standard three core cable we've got a live neutral and an earth in there this is the important one so what I'd recommend is for delivering power you can generally use unshielded cable which is what this is same for the three core coming in. However, when it comes to delivering signals to your steppers coming from your board, I recommend you get three core shielded cable. If you've ever played with CNCs before, you'll know that the spindles can generate some serious frequencies and that can cause interference with your signals. I've had it happen a few times, even on my 3018 machine, where you're, you're doing a job and all of a sudden you've got an alarm going off and there's absolutely no reason for it. The reason for it is there's been interference between your spindle and your signal wires. So having a three core shielded cable like this one helps prevent that. And you'll know if it's shielded because you have your regular cores in there. You can see red, white and yellow. And then you've got this strandy, wiry type of stuff, which is wrapped around the cables, shielding them from any interference. So when we do the final version of this, any signals like pulse, and including the encoders as well, driving the signals to the motors, will all be done with shielded cable. In the meantime, for our benchtop test, I'm simply using some speaker cable. The reason I like this is just because it's neat and disposable you know I had a 25 meter roll of this for a fiver perfect for testing purposes but we probably wouldn't want to use this to deliver signals between these the other thing that I completely forgot to mention in the previous video was the proximity switches now again these will be shielded in there as well and these will let us home the machine and detect where it is so we'll have them mounted I'll have one mounted on the gantry here, we'll have them mounted on the back, potentially even the front as well, so we can detect on both sides of the axis. These, again, are going to run into the machine. These are probably going to need extensions on them too, which is what this cable will be handy for. These will come in and connect to our main board there, where we can set that up in Mac 3. In terms of the overall layout here, what I'm going for is just to try and keep everything nice and tidy, right? I've got these separated out, which should make the wiring of them pretty straightforward. So the wiring that comes with the 
motors has a limited length on it and ideally I don't want to have to extend it. So the reason for placing these at the top is so that the cables can come straight in at the top here and route straight to wherever they need to go without having to route loads of cable down at the bottom. So I've tried to keep the power electronics down here and particularly keeping the VFD as far away from this stuff as I can. I might even think about putting a shield around it as well. And the same for each of these then. So this one can come straight in, this one can come straight in. So we should have nice neat wiring just straight down, straight into where it needs to go. Power then being routed from this power supply up to each of those. And this power supply, like I said, will power that board, giving us our signals. I may change this as I go. You know, a lot of people tend to mount these this way, like this, because again, it's a space saver, right? You can save a lot of space in there. However, you do tend to have some messy wiring and it's hard to read the labels when they're that way, right? So I just prefer them this way. But like I said, I'll see how it goes. I want to get an Intel nook in here as well. So we'll have a direct connection to that board in the box also. I'm going to have to figure out a way of getting a signal out of that up to a screen with a keyboard and a mouse and all that good stuff. So this is my plan going forward. Like I said, it may change. What I'll likely do is have another big piece of OSB, secure all this down to it, and then the OSB will be secured down to the metal enclosure. My plan then is to secure the enclosure to the back of the machine. So all the cables will run from the back, making it easy and requiring less cable to deliver to the motors. It's going to provide easy access for the Y motors, obviously, because they're at the back. The X and the Z, we only have to stretch as far as that corner, which should make it as clean and tidy as possible. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to head over to the bench there and I'll show you exactly how to wire up one of these to a closed loop NEMA motor and interface it with this board in Mac 3 to test to see if our motors and drivers are working. I'm going to try and make it as easy as possible. I've got a few diagrams that will help you out. So let's go and do that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do here is get our two power supplies wired up to take power from our mains. When I obviously create the final system, they won't be taking power from a plug like this they'll be wired into the fuses with cable. But to test this out in a benchtop scenario, I've rigged up a couple of plugs here with some wires for each power supply. So I'm gonna to to focus on the small power supply to begin with. So on the power supply, we've got L here, which is live. We've got N for neutral, and then we've got earth. So again, I'm in the UK. The colors I have on my wire here is brown, which is live, blue, neutral, and green and yellow is earth. I want to emphasize again, if you're in a different country with different regulations, your wiring could very well be different. So you need to check that and make sure that you're doing it correctly. So in my case here, I'm going to be twisting these just like this. Make sure they're all together. And I'm going to wire this straight in. Now I'm just doing this for test purposes here, but ideally what you'd want to do is crimp these on with a little hook that the screw goes through so that they can't be pulled out. In my case, like I said, these are not going to be in there for more than an hour. So I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes. So all you simply do here you loosen the screws off. So we'll do them one at a time. I'm just going to get the earth on first. And as you can see, you just screw it down, clamp it nice and tight. Give it a tag as long as it doesn't pull out. It's going to be okay. I'm going to put our neutral on. Tighten that down. Then we're going to put our live on. I'm going to clamp that one down as well. So secure them down nice and tight. And then when you're done, double check live neutral earth. 
In this case, we've got brown, blue, and yellow and green. Now from there, I've prepared another piece of wire here that's gonna go from this power supply to our board that's gonna control the drivers. So on here, on the other side, you can see we've got two rails for V minus, two rails for V plus. So my red wire here goes to one of the V plus, my black wire goes to one of the V minus. This comes with a little plastic cover that protects from anything touching those because they're going to be live when we switch it on. Now again, double check, we've got our black going to our V minus, our red going to our V plus. Give them a tug, make sure they don't fall out. Same with these ones, looks good. So at this point, what we can now do is give this a test. So what I have here is a multimeter. This can measure voltage and current, resistance, it can measure a lot of things. Depending on which one you've got, some are more fancier than others, but all we want to do is measure some voltage. So I'm going to go and grab some clips now. What I have here are crocodile clips, and I'm going to connect the red to the red wire here. And I'm going to connect my black test probe here to the black wire. I would definitely recommend testing your power supply before you connect it to any electronics because you want to make sure that the voltage coming out of here is what is advertised. This should be outputting 24 volts and there's a little potentiometer here where you can adjust that if it isn't quite where you want it to be. So I'm going to plug this in now so I have to pull it over here a little bit. I've plugged that in, we've got our wire coming out. I'm going to switch this on to the 200 setting. I'm going to turn my power supply on. And what we should read, if this does what it says it does, is 24 volts. So I'm going to switch that on now. And there we go, you can see we've got 24.1 coming out of there. So like I said, you can adjust that if you want. I'm happy with 24.1, 24.2. I'm confident now that if I connect this to my Mac 3 board that it's getting the voltage that it expects. It might sound over the top but sometimes you know if you've got a faulty power supply it might be chucking out 40, 50 volts and if you connect that to your board it will destroy it. So we've done that one, I'm going to turn this off now and I'm going to switch this back off for a second and move it out of the way so I'm going to disconnect these one at a time. And be careful because even though we've turned that off, power supplies contain capacitors which hold charge for quite a while. These could potentially still be live and you don't want to be touching them. So I'm going to move this out of the way. And now we're going to move on to our larger power supply. So I'm going to put the 24 volt supply out of the way. Now this one obviously is a lot bigger and a lot more powerful. However, the wiring process is exactly the same. So we've got live, neutral, earth. And then on this one we actually have three terminals for DC negative out and three terminals for DC positive out or ground and positive. So same as before, I've prepared a dummy plug here for me to demonstrate this on the bench for you. So I'm going to make sure I wind these nice and tightly. Just like in the last scenario, we're going to undo these quite a bit just so we can slide those in. And again, we've got live, neutral and earth, which for the UK wiring, Live is brown, neutral is blue, and earth is yellow and green. So one at a time, I'm gonna put these on. I'm gonna go for the earth first. 
Just going to clamp that on. Like I said before, these are just going on for testing purposes, so I'm able to just slide the wire in and clamp them down. If you're looking to use these permanently, use the crimping sets and make sure you've got a proper fixture on the end of the wire. So that one's on as well. I'm just going to get the neutral in there. This one's a little bit fiddly. we go we've got them tightened down again we have another wire here which will be used for our outputs like I said we've got ground or negative on this side we've got negative on this side positive on this side so I have my black cable is going to go to the negative clamp that one down and then I have my red cable which is going to go to V plus before we plug anything in double check live neutral earth we have brown blue and yellow and green and we have this black wire connected to V minus and the red one connected to V+. Plus. Close the plastic shield there. And we're going to do the same thing again. So I'm going to grab my multimeter. I'm going to take my two crocodile clips here. I'm going to place the black one on the black cable and the red one on the red cable. I'm going to plug this in. I'm not going to switch it on yet. Make sure that these do not touch because you will short the circuit. You want to keep these apart at all times. I'm going to switch it to 200. Now what we should see out of here is 36 volts. Again, I'm going to switch this on. There we go. This one has a fan on it as well on the back to help keep it cool. And you can see our output there is 35.6, 35.7. Again, we can tweak that if we want to with a potentiometer. I'm happy with that for now for testing. If I run into issues, I might come back and adjust it later. But this is absolutely fine. I'm now confident that both power supplies output the correct voltage, which I can use to power my microelectronics. So now I'll switch this off again. I'm gonna switch this off too. Again, remember, there'll still be voltage in there that's slowly depleting out of the capacitors. Be careful not to touch these together or to touch both of them at the same time. So I'm going to remove the power supply. And here we go. So we now have, you can still see the light is on there, even though we've unplugged it. Right? And that's exactly what I mean. And over time, that light will fade as the capacitors discharge. So I'm going to move the multimeter out of the way. Right, okay, so we now have our 36 volt power supply that's going to provide power to our stepper driver. So I'm going to put that to one side over here and plug it in. So now what I have here is the positive and negative coming from the 36 volt power supply. Right, so now what we'll do is take a look at our closed loop stepper driver. What I have here is a data sheet for the specific driver that I have, which shows all the different pins, what they do, and how they correspond here to the physical device. So if we put our physical device here, you can see that straight away we notice that these connector blocks are in different sections. And just so you know, these can actually be removed like this, so you can wire it up outside of the unit and then install them if you want to. I don't really need to do that. Just pop the wire in and tighten it down. 
So in this case, at the bottom, we've got VDC and ground. This also shows NC. That means no connection and we don't have to worry about it. We just set up our 36 volt power supply. So we want our V plus from that to come in here and our V minus from that to come into ground. The next section here is our motor. And if we move this back out of the way, if we come to the motor connection section, it shows you we've got motor A plus, A minus, B plus and B minus. They are the four motor cables that will carry the instructions from the controller telling the motor how to move. The next section here, which we've also got on our controller, is the encoder. This has got six different connections on it, carrying the encoder data that's going to ensure that our motor is where it's supposed to be. So again, on our diagram here, we've got the six different outputs. We've got encoder phase B output, phase A output, and the supply for the encoder that's built into the motor. And that's all we're going to worry about for now. So this top section is the signal section. We'll come back to this afterwards because this section contains the signals that we send from the board to control the motor and tell this what to do. So here's my closed loop NEMA 23 motor. And out of the box, it looks exactly like this. We've got these two wires coming off it. This one contains the encoder data. This one here has just four wires which correspond to the A and B phases for the motor. And that tells the motor how to operate. When I bought my motors, they came with extension cables. As you can see here, this is the exact opposite of the connection we've got here. So this one just goes straight in there. There's a little notch so you can line them up correctly, which gives you an extension to that particular cable. Now, you'll notice on the other end, we've got bare wire. There are four wires in total, as we'd expect here, because we have four pins to connect for our motor. If we look at the other one, we've got the same extension end that goes into the motor. And on the other side, we've got six of our cables here and another cable here, which is just for the shielding. You can leave that disconnected for now. And that will connect to these. So we're now at a point where we need to kind of figure out, okay, we know what is what, but how do we know which color goes where? Now, one thing I'd recommend also is read the user manual for your closed loop stepper driver that comes with it. This contains a lot of useful information, including troubleshooting as well. And a really essential step before you power this up, by default, these come in 24 volt mode. So there's a little switch up here. When your driver arrives, the switch will be set to the right, which as you can see there is 24 volts. The reason they do that is for safety because this can be powered by 24 volt or 5 volt signals. Now, if you are in 5 volt mode and you send 24 volt signals through this, you're going to destroy it. If you're running the same board as me that has 5 volt outputs, what you'll want to do is set this to 5 volts, which is where the switch is set all the way to the left. As you can see, 5 volts. So I've done that on all my steppers, drive it to the left, and you should be in 5 volt mode. Here is another very useful bit of information that I acquired from the manufacturer's website. So where we were talking about before, where we're wondering which color wire corresponds to each of these, this tells us that. So this tells us the motor and encoder connection, which references these here. There's another diagram you can look at, which has pin numbers for each of these and tells you which motor signal they correspond to. We're not interested in that because we have these extensions which only go on one way. So what we're interested in is these here. We've got the motor extension cable connection and the encoder extension cable connection. So let's have a look at the motor first. 
first of all, look which colour wires you've got. Because with my particular motor here, there are two different options. There's white, green, blue and black, or black, green, red and blue. In my case, I've got black, green, red and blue. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of this, because I'm not interested in that one. My pen's run out. The one I want is this one, right? I've got black, green, red and blue. So coming back to our driver here, so let's look at our motor signals here. We've got A+. So we know that A+, is pin 1. And if we come back here, we know that pin 1 is black. Therefore, we can know that the black wire goes to pin 1, which is A+. And that's how you figure the wiring out. Let's look at A-. A- is pin 2. Pin 2 is green. So we know that A- goes to the green wire. Same thing, let's look at B+. Pin 3 is B+. Pin 3 is red. So we know that B plus is red. Pin 4 is B minus. We know that pin 4 is blue. So there we go. You can see how we correspond the different color wires to the connections that they need to go to. It's quite straightforward. Now, that's that one that has four connections on it. Now let's take a look at the encoder. So let's look at EB plus. We can see here that EB plus is pin 11. And we know that pin 11 is yellow. So that top encoder connection is going to be yellow. The same here. Let's look at EB minus is going to be pin 12. Pin 12 is green. You get the idea. So for the motor and the encoder, you simply have to match the pin to the label and the pin to the color and it's that simple. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and wire those up and then we we'll look at connecting our Mac 3 board to our stepper driver. You'll notice I've looped my cable here which is just for demonstration purposes so I haven't got cables all over my desk. Let's start with the motor, right? This is the most simple one. So I'm going to go ahead and wire them. You're going to need a very small flat head screwdriver to undo these. So I'm going to start with B-, minus, which in this case is pin 4, and that's going to be blue. So our B-, minus, pin 4, blue. So I'm going to put that in, simply hold it in place, tighten it down. Our next one is B+, plus, which is going to be pin 3. Pin 3 is red. Gonna tighten that down. We're then gonna go for A minus. A minus is pin two. Pin two is green. So A minus is our green. Next one is A plus, pin one which is obviously the last cable here, which is black. So we're going to pop that in there, hold it in and tighten down. Nicely done. It's as simple as that. That's the motor wired up and ready to go. Now let's take a look at the encoder. There's a lot more wires here, a little bit more fiddly, but it's exactly the same process. So let's start with E ground. So this is encoder ground, which we've got here is pin three. Pin three is white. So we're gonna connect the white cable to that bottom pin. Let's go ahead and insert that. Just hold it in there and clamp it down. VCC, I'm going to assume is red, but also I'm going to double check. VCC is pin 2. Pin 2 is red. So our VCC pin is going to go straight in here. Next 
Next up, we've got EA minus. EA minus is pin 13, which is blue. Get the blue one clamped down. We've then got EA plus, which is pin one which is going to be black. We've then got EB minus, which is pin 12, which is green. And the final one should be yellow, which is EB plus, 11, yellow. Let's put that last one in. And there we go. So what I'd recommend now is to double check your wiring. Always a good idea. We've wired up our motor and our encoder. And like I said, when you see this, it looks intimidating, but all we've done is look up colors and pin numbers and put them in the right place. The only thing remaining to connect on this bottom end is the power, but like I said, we're gonna do that last. What we'll look at now is connecting the motor up, and then I'm gonna to talk to you about the control board where we're gonna direct our signals so that we can run this in Mac 3. All right, so I'm trying to give you the best possible views I can here. So you can see here, like I said, we've got our motor wired up, we've got our encoder wired up, and you can clearly see which colors are which. And remember, you need to reference the diagrams. Like I said, if you have a different motor to me or a different driver, these are likely to be different. So you need to check the colors for your specific devices. Right, now let's take a look here at the Mac 3 board. Like I've said in prior videos, there's nothing special about this board at all. It is very cheap. You can pick them up between five and 10 pounds, depending where you buy them. However, they do work and they're great for setups like this, where if you're doing a DIY build, you just want to get the thing running, make sure it's working and get familiar with it, right? It doesn't make sense to start out with a three, 400 quid board when you're not super comfortable with what you're doing yet start with something that's replaceable like this one because ultimately the more expensive boards interface to all the same hardware and you just want to get what you can out of a small board like this to begin with so let's take a look at the board i have an old laptop here that i've set up it's running windows 7 which is generally what people use to run mac 3. there is mac 4 as well which is a newer version but there are mixed opinions of that and you don't really need it to run the machine to be honest so first thing when you get your board we've got a usb port here and it should come with a cable so first thing i'm going to do is connect this up make sure it works if we plug it in what you should see is just a blinking light that means that the board is waiting for a signal from something like mach 3 to control it so we're happy with that and we're going to leave it there for now. So let's unplug it. And something really important to note is whenever you're doing any kind of wiring, when your computer is involved and connected, never have the USB plugged in when you're tinkering around with wires, because if there's a short or a problem, again, that can propagate back to your computer and potentially damage your computer. That's not what you want. Always keep it unplugged whenever you're messing around here with screwdrivers or wires. So taking a look at the board itself, you can see there are two sections of the board where we have headers here. This section here is a five volt section. Now, back to what I talked about earlier with the driver. 
our drive signals for this are going to come from the 5 volt section of this board meaning that we had to flip that toggle switch there from 24 volts to 5 volts now some of the more advanced boards out there will drive these with 24 volt signals and like I said if, if this was a 24 volt signal and you're pushing it into this which is in 5 volt mode you would fry this don't want to do that our signals are 5 volts here because we have a 5 volt output powered by the USB and that ultimately will come into here with 5 volt signals so make sure you set that correctly this section down here takes a 24 volt input from our other power supply now for this demo we won't need to connect that power supply but when we connect up limit switches to this we will need to connect that 24 volt supply to this part of the board and you can see there's a 24 volts there all of our proximity sensors will interface to this side of the board and all of our signal data to drive the steppers comes from this side of the board if you read the text on there we've got 10 volts 5 volts ground we've got XP which is X pulse XD which is X direction same for the others so we've got X pulse X direction Y pulse Y direction Z pulse Z direction and A pulse and A direction and that's because this board supports four axes. There's going to be a bit of configuration required later on in upcoming videos because my Y axis has two motors, not one. So I have two options there. I can either sacrifice an additional axis here or run the other motor as a slave to this one. But we'll get to that later on. All we need to focus on for now is our five volts and our pulse and direction so I'm going to be using Y pulse and Y direction here to give you a demo and that's what we're going to be wiring up now so let's take a look here let's bring our stepper driver back into the mix here so we've got our board up here and our motor which is going to be here so what I'm going to do is connect the motor up we've got these wires that simply just join together nice and straightforward same for this one it actually has a little notch in it you match the notches up so you can't possibly get it wrong and we're going to connect our motor there let me just tidy this up there we go one thing I'm going to do here, which is going to be useful later, is put a little bit of tape on the stepper so that you can see if it moves. So coming back to our closed loop stepper driver now, what we've got here is at the top, we only need to deal with the top four pins. The rest are optionals that you can use. There's brake, alarm, lots of different things for other features. All we want to do in this case is send a signal from this board to this driver on how to move the motor. So to do that, we need a direction and a pulse. So what we're going to do here is set our pulse positive and our direction positive to 5 volts, which is a logic high, right? So to do this, I have this neat little connector block here. So this connector block is just a way to share a signal in multiple paths, right? What I see a lot of people do, because we're doing direction plus and pulse plus the same 5 volts, a lot of people will jump that with a short wire. The problem with that is you've got to cram two wires in there and it can start to get very messy. So given that we're going to have a lot of these shared 5 volt values when we have our four drivers, this block here can take a 5 volt signal from the board and then you can chain off that as many times as you like. Now it is worth noting, this is an earth block, which means that the whole thing conducts. So when I do the final build in the enclosure, what I'll probably do is 3D 
print an enclosure for this so that only the connections are exposed. If you don't have one of these, what you can do is just twist these wires together. So I have three separate wires. One wire here is going to come from the 5 volt output on this board. And I'll give you a close up of it in a second, so don't worry. I'm just going to connect this. I'm going to twist it nicely like before. I'm going to go to my 5 volt signal here, which is the second one up. I'm going to pop that in there and tighten it down. So there we go. We have a 5 volt signal coming out of our main board up to this terminal block. And then all I'm going to do is piggyback off of that. We're going to put a 5 volt signal into our direction plus here. So I'm going to pop that one in. Clamp that one down. We're going to put a 5 volt signal into our pulse plus here. Clamp that one down. And we're done with that. So all we need to do now is connect our pulse and direction wires from our controller board to our driver. So again, I have two separate wires to do this. I've, again, I've used the speaker cable in this case, but what you'd want to do, like I said at the start, any connections sending signals, you want to use shielded cable because we don't want any interference from any high frequencies. This is just a desktop demonstration. So I'm just using regular core cable here because it's fine for this application. So as you'd expect, what we've got remaining is pulse minus and direction minus. And we know on this board, we've got a YP and a YD. So it makes sense and it's logical that pulse here is going to go to Y pulse there and that would be correct. So all we're going to do is connect Y pulse on this board. To YP on this board. And tighten that down. Then the remaining one, we're going to connect direction minus from this board. To YD or Y direction on our control board. And tighten it down. So there we go. Let's go through that one more time. I'll try and bring you in closer as well so you can get a better look at it. Okay, so here's a bird's eye view of what we've just done. We've connected the top four connections here to our control board. Our pulse positive and our direction positive are piggybacking off the five volt signal here. So we've got five volts out up to this terminal block. That 5 volts is being fed down through these two wires to pulse positive and direction positive. The other terminals here are pulse minus and direction minus. We've connected our pulse minus from this board to our YP or Y pulse on this board. And we've connected our direction minus to YD or Y direction on this board. And believe it or not, that is it. Right, so what you're gonna do at this point is triple check your wiring, right? Check your motors, check your encoders with the color chart, and go through these and make sure they match up to what I said. The last thing we're gonna do is connect our 36 volt power supply to our stepper driver, which is just gonna power this unit. And we do that by connecting our red to VDC and our black to ground. 
So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Just going to tighten them on. So there we go, we've got our red going to VDC, our black going to ground, and that is now ready to be tested. Right, so at this point, what you'd want to do is connect up your board to the computer. Again, you should see that red LED blink in there, which indicates that it's waiting for a connection from Mac 3. Now I've launched the Mac 3 loader here, and I'm going to select Mac 3 mil USB, which is the profile that I created earlier. I'm going to hit OK. That's going to load up Mac 3. First thing you'll want to do when you enter is reset. And you should see that LED should turn solid. So if I reset, you see that that now is solid red and it's no longer blinking. That means it's made a connection. So what I'll do now is I'll turn on my power supply here, which should deliver power to our board. And if power is being delivered successfully to your driver, you'll see a little green LED. You probably won't see it on camera because it's down here on the side. But I'm now going to switch on the power supply. The green LED is on. So as you know, I connected the Y direction and Y pulse signals to the driver, which means it's expecting the Y motor. So if I move the up and down arrows here on the keyboard, we should see this move. And there we go. If I come back, and that means we've successfully wired up one of our motors. Now, one of the really good things about these encoded motors is that they always keep their true position, and that's the whole idea behind it. Whereas on open loop motors, if you skip a few steps, a job you're working on would be ruined. Whereas these sort of hybrid closed loop setups, if I were to move this now, it would literally move itself back to where it should be. So let's try it again. It works perfectly, that's exactly what we want. Now what I'll say at this point is it's very useful to take this opportunity to test out all your motors and drivers. So to test a different motor, all we'd have to do is take this off here and apply a new one. So first thing we're going to do, turn off the power supply. So you always want to turn off your mains power first. At that point, we want to disconnect the main board. And now we're in a position to put in a different motor. So I'm going to take this out. Same with this one. Let's put this one aside for a second. So I've got another motor here. I'm going to connect this one up really quickly. Same with this one. And now, what I'm going to recommend here is when reconnecting, you connect your USB first, then reset in Mac 3, and then do your power supply. Now, you'll want to do it in that order simply because if you have your power supply on and you randomly just connect your USB board, there may still be data being sent through there to your driver, which is going to freak your motor out a bit. So always connect your board, reset, and then we're going to go over here, switch the power back on. And now I'm going to try and move again. And there we go. You can see it working. I'll put a bit of tape on there for you again, just so you can see. So 
So again, there we go. So I've popped a bit of tape on there again for you. And that works nicely. So I'll also show you now how you can quickly test your stepper drivers as well. So I'll bring you back over this side and give you a shot of that. Now with your stepper drivers, you might think, you know, it's gonna be quite a faff on doing all of these and then putting them all back in there. But remember, these come out. So if you pull all of these out of another driver, for example, you'll end up with something that looks like this. So all you have to do is pull these ones out As you can see we've got all those out of there. Put the driver you know works aside and simply pop the new one back in. Now again I recommend starting at the top. You just want to give them a nice push on there. Work your way down. Get that one. Should you have a nice click when they go in. and then the power goes in last. And there we go. We simply changed our stepper out as quick as that. So now I'm gonna connect up the PC again. I'm gonna reset in Mac 3. Turn on my power supply. You can see now that green light that I was talking about. That means normal operation. If there's something wrong, the red LED will blink. And like I said, there's a user manual here that actually troubleshoots some of those issues. So in my case, on page six here, you can see each different error has different pulses of LED. So the LED will pulse three times there and one time, which means chip error. So if yours isn't working and you have a red LED, look at the book. And in that scenario, you might be able to get a RMA, just get a replacement. I'm quite lucky because I bought these probably three to six months ago, and this is the first time I've tested them. Step Online are a very good company though. Um, I'm sure they would have replaced them anyway, but everything was working straight out of the box. Very pleased with that. So with this new one connected, let's do the same thing. Let's try and move, and we should see our motor move here. And there we go backwards and forwards nicely done so to test out all your motors simply swap them out here very easy to test the motors and to test out all your step drivers remember switch off then disconnect your USB so that you have no connections to anything then you can replace all these and put them into the next driver. Now there's only one other thing I think is worth mentioning here is the current and gain setting here. Now I've just left mine at the moment on zero, which is factory default. The manual recommends leaving it on zero until you've got everything up and running. And from there you can start to tweak the gain table to optimize the performance of your machine. I've also left the pulses per revolution default to the way that they arrived. In my case, the only switches that are on here are one, three, and four, which corresponds to a pulses per revolution of 1600. Now that will all need to be configured and optimized later on when everything's running on the machine. But for this kind of testing, just leave it all at default. Uh, make sure all your hardware works and from there you can be confident that everything's going to work when you wire it up and you can move on to starting to do the enclosure. Right guys, so what I'm going to do now is show you how to set up Mac 3 on your PC. So I'm running Windows 10 here. 
Mac 3 traditionally runs best on Windows 7, but you can get it to install on Windows 8, 10 or 11 by opting to not install the parallel driver port, which is apparently what causes all the issues. I'm on the Mac 3 website here, I'll leave a link below. We can try it out for free, so we're going to download Mac 3. It is free initially, but it has a G code limit, so if you want to use it without any limits, you have to buy a license for it. So what we'll do here is double click the EXE, which is going to install Mac 3. So we're going to run through that now. So I'm going to click next. I'm going to agree to the license terms. We're going to install it to this directory. Now this is the important part. We want to uncheck this parallel port driver here. If you're running Windows 7 and you obviously require a parallel port, then you'd want to keep that checked. But in this case, we're running it over USB, so we don't need that. I'm also going to unselect lazy cam here because I'm not interested in using that. So I'm going to click next, next, and next again. And that's going to finish up the installation for us. Mac 3 has just installed on our local C drive here. So if you go in there, you'll see a folder called Mac 3. And in here are a bunch of configuration files and profiles that will load that program. In order to run this program on that little control board, we have to paste in a few files here. So I'll provide links to those files. The two files in question are this one here, mac3mil underscore testing, which is an XML file. So basically what that is, it's a custom profile that's been pre-configured for this specific board. So rather than have to set Mac3 up to run the board yourself, this profile kind of provides you a baseline to get the board working and then from there you can tweak it and optimize it for your machine. So we're going to take that one first, we're going to copy this and then we're going to just paste it into this Mac3 directory here. We're going to paste it straight in and you'll see it down there underneath the default profile which is Mac3mil. I renamed mine to Mac3mil underscore testing just so I can differentiate the two. The next thing we want to do is navigate to the plugins folder. I'm going to right click this plugin here, rnrmotion.dll. I'm going to copy that, paste that into our plugins folder. And there we go, you'll see it in there. So let's go back. That's all you need to do. What we'll do now is go to the Windows taskbar. I can see Mac 3 Loader up here. If you can't, you can obviously just search it and you'll find it. So I'm going to click on that. That's going to pop a window up here where you can see all the different profiles. Like I said, Mac 3 mil is the default, but we are going to select the one we just added in, which is Mac 3 mil underscore testing. So we're going to click OK. That's going to load the program up for us. And straight away, you'll see this window pop up here. It's asking us what control device we want to use. Now, it's defaulted to this printer port operation. But the plugin we just added was RNR Motion Controller Eco V2. So we're going to select that and then click OK. If you don't want this window to pop up every time, you can check this. But I'm not going to do that here, I'm just going to hit OK. And that's all you have to do. Right, so seeing as we're here, I thought I'd show you how to set up proximity sensors so that you can home your machine. Now this board the way it's set up in Mac 3, we can run all of the proximity sensors through a single port here, which is port 3. The way I imagine that works is each axis homes one at a time, and it's just simply looking for the signal when that particular axis is moving. The proximity switches I've ordered are NPN normally open. So that looks like this. Uh, we have three wires on there. We have a black wire, a brown wire, and a blue wire. Now the brown wire we connect to positive, the blue wire we connect to negative, and the black wire is the signal. The way the NPN normally open works is that the signal line, the black line, produces a negative voltage when an object is detected. And our software will see that change 
and flag it as an object being detected. So I'm going to show you how to wire this up now. So just like I said before, in order to run these, we need to connect them to this side of the board. Now we know from earlier that this side is the 5 volt signal side, and this side is the 24 volt side. So what we'll need to do is connect our 24 volt supply to our board. And if you look on the board, there's two pins up there. We've got 24 volts and DCM. That stands for DC common. So we want to connect our red wire from our 24 volt supply to the 24 volt pin and the black or negative wire from our 24 volt supply to DCM. In this case, what I've done, just like before, given that we'd have a few sensors, I've set up these terminal blocks again. So I've got my 24 volt positive running into this block. And I've got my 24 volt negative running into this block and I'm piggybacking off those into the board. For now I'm just going to jump this off the 24 volt on the DCM because otherwise I'd have to strip this back and run cables up there. But when I do the final build, what I would do is take the positive and negative here and connect those to my blocks. Again, you can see the idea, we can have nice neat wiring for each sensor. We just take a jump off these blocks here and run the signal line down to the board. Right, so like I said there, we know our 24 volt is our red wire here. So I'm going to put that one in to the 24 volt pin. We also know that our brown wire here on our sensor needs to connect to the positive rail, which in this case is the 24 volt. So I'm going to pop that one in there as well. Then I'm going to tighten that one down. We've then got our negative from our 24 volt power supply, which is going to go into DCM. We also know that the blue wire from our sensor needs to connect to DCM as well. So we'll push those in and tighten that up. Then we've got our black wire here, which is our signal, which we're going to connect to in three, which is signal input three. So we'll pop that in there, tighten that one up. So just to run through that one more time, I have my 24 volt power supply here. We've got my positive 24 volts here. We've got my negative 24 volts here. The 24 volt needs to go into the 24 volt line on the board. The negative needs to go to the DCM connection on the board. All I've done here for the sensor is connected the brown wire to 24 volts and the blue wire to DCM and the black wire to signal input 3. Now like I said, for demonstration purposes here, I've just jumped off the main terminals here. But ideally what we do in a larger setup where we've got, you know, three, four, maybe even more sensors is we take those positive and negative wires and we piggyback them off these blocks here. That way they can be routed nicely out to wherever they need to go. And the only lines we need to come down here are the signal lines. You can see pretty easily how this could quickly become a nest of wires if you're trying to connect all your signal terminals in here for the sensor. So that should be good to go now. So what I'll do is I'll show you the laptop screen here which has got Mac 3 on it. And I'll show you how you can check that the signal line is expecting an input from this and show you it working live on Mac 3. Right, so you can see here I have Mac 3 loaded up on this laptop. So just like before, I'm going to connect up the board via USB. I need to reset here on the bottom. I'm on the program run tab. Now what I'm going to do is switch on my 24 volt power supply, which will give power to the sensor here. Now what you want to check is go into config tab at the top here, ports and pins, come over to the input signals tab and you'll see here we've got X home, Y home and Z home. They're enabled and they're set to port 3 and that means that we're selecting that input port 3 from the board so that's correct. So I'm going to hit OK. Now if we come over to the diagnostics tab here if you take a look down here, we've got the M1 home, M2 home, and M3 home sensors. So I have the proximity sensor here, and I also have a piece of aluminium. And when I bring these together, 
you should see those signals on the screen light up. And there we go. So you can see that my sensor is detecting contact there straight away with the aluminium frame. You can see I can tap it and they light up straight away. And that's what's going to enable us to home our machine when we're moving the axis back. The second we make contact, we can trigger that. You can also configure these to work at a distance. So obviously you might not want to make contact. You might want to be a few mil away which can be set up as well. Right guys, so there we go. Hopefully that was useful and a good guide in terms of getting started communicating with the relevant hardware here. Like I said, this is a desktop demonstration, but this is where you should start, right? You don't want to start trying to tackle the whole thing when you may be not so comfortable hooking up the motors. Now, knowing what I know, I've tested all my drivers, all my motors, and I know if I wire them all up this way, and interface them to the board in the same way that ultimately the whole machine will work. From here it's literally just a case of trying to make the wiring as tidy as I can and in the next video we'll take a look at the VFD that's a completely different part of the circuit as I said and that will have its own power source and also need to be integrated into Mark 3 as well. So there we go guys hopefully you found that video extremely valuable I haven't seen a NEMA stepper guide anywhere else on YouTube as comprehensive as this one. I wish I had this video when I was trying to set this up, so I figured it all out myself and I've been able to relay that to you guys to make it as easy as possible for you. So as I said, I hope you found it useful. If you've got any questions at all, as always, please just leave them down below and I'd be happy to answer them. Remember, come and join the Discord community as well, I'll leave a link in the description below come and chat to the other people that are also interested in this build. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next video.